All right, so this is the start of your bacteria virus unit video notes. These video notes are just going to focus on bacteria. So first, before we get to that, we need to talk about basic structure, eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. And don't get confused, these headings are on opposite sides. So this is a prokaryotic cell, and this is a eukaryotic cell. As you can see, the prokaryotic cells are very simple. They have the same parts, but eukaryotic cells have all of those other organelles, your mitochondria, your Golgi, your ER, all of those things are only in eukaryotic. So bacteria is a prokaryotic cell. So it's really important that you know this. So some characteristics about prokaryotes. First of all, single cell. There's no true nucleus, but really important, there is DNA. Okay, all cells have DNA, they just don't necessarily have a nucleus. There are a few organelles, there are some ribosomes, but that's pretty much it. And then there's two types, which we should know from the previous unit. So we have archaebacteria, which is your extremes, and then eubacteria, which are your normals. So, more eukaryotes, prokaryotes. So eukaryotes are larger, more complex, they have a nucleus, they have chromosomes, membrane-bound organelles, and here's your examples. Really important that you know these. Prokaryotes, then, are the opposite. Smaller, not as complex, no nucleus. They have a single strand of DNA. So chromosomes, as you know, are made of DNA, but prokaryotes just have a single strand of DNA. And then there's no membrane-bound organelles. And your example, bacteria. So characteristics of bacteria. Prokaryotes, the word in general, something to file away, means before a nucleus. So these are going to be your earlier types of organisms. And there's two domains, which if you remember the domains, there's only three total. So the two of them are bacteria themed. So we have bacteria and archaea. Archaea bacteria, extreme environments, you should know that by now. Here are the three types again. Once again, this is review but you should probably review it because we're going to get a little more detailed. So your thermo, remember, think of thermo, think of hot or temperature. And then those are your hot acidic areas, thermal vents on the fl ocean floor, hot springs, etc. Halophiles live in very salty areas, Great Salt Lake in Utah, the Dead Sea. And then methanogens, we talked about releasing methane which is kind of what cows release. So they don't use oxygen, so they're anaerobic, and they take in oxygen but give off the methane. So these are going to live in things like sewage treatment, swamps, bogs. This is what gives you that odor. Eubacteria, on the other hand, is found everywhere, obviously, except those extreme environments. Most studied organism. There's a few reasons for that. Fast reproduction... They're small. Those are pretty much just the two major ones that I want you to know. But it's a very common organism for scientists to use because of these reasons. They have very strong cell walls, and they actually have a second wall sometimes. So prokaryote structure. Now this picture obviously has more than I want you to know, but important, you need to know the DNA. The flagella is basically the tail. It's here, it's called a bacterial flagellum. Just call it a flagella. It's way easier. And then we've done those two. Pillies are just the little hairs. Those are pili. Ribosomes are all those dots you see in the middle. And then the capsule is kind of like the outside protection. So there's a cell wall and then there's the capsule that completely surrounds it. So the capsule is why bacteria can live in so many different environments and still be so successful. So function of the structure, DNA, remember, it's the information of, of the bacteria in general. Remember, they do not have a nucleus. The capsule is a polysaccharide. You should remember that from the biochemistry unit. It means a sugar. It helps prevent dry out. So a lot of times, bacteria are in areas where it could be dry, so they need to stay moist. And then WBC, those are white blood cells. So when you're sick and you have a bacterial infection, it prevents the white blood cells from being able to eat them. It's kind of like their defense mechanism. 
So the pili made of protein, their hair, think about your hair, your hair is made of a protein-like structure too, and it helps with attachment. Flagella helps with locomotion or movement, and then the ribosomes make your proteins. So how do we identify bacteria? So there's three major reasons. One is shape, two is cell walls, three is movement. So let's talk about shape. So there's six of them here. They're kind of usually paired together. They're not always on their own. So the first three are going to be more of a shape, and the last three are going to be more of an arrangement. So the coxy is going to be a spherical round shape, and then the bacilli is your rod shaped, and then spirilli is spiral. This one's easy to remember because spirilli looks like spiral, but the other two you're just going to have to remember and keep them straight. Now we have the arrangements. So remember, these are shapes, and these three are arrangements. Okay, so your arrangements are down here. So diplo, remember, di means two. So you have two. Staphylo is a clump, so a big clump. And then strepto is a chain. Now, sometimes when people are sick, you hear these words used, so staphylococcus or streptobacillus. That just means a staphylococcus is going to be a clump of the spherical round shaped, whereas streptobacillus would be a chain of the rod shaped. So let's practice. So if you draw the following, so staphylococcus, if we go back and look, staphylo is a clump, coccus is a spherical, so this one's just going to be a bunch of little dots in a clump. And you will have to do this on a quiz. I'm going to give you ones and then combinations, and you have to draw them. So next up, streptococcus. So if we go back, strepto is a long chain, and then back to coccus again is spherical. So this is going to be just a chain of that one. So if you write the types below, this is going to be a rod shaped. This is the bacilli. This one's a spiral, so spirilli. And here's your cylinder, so coxy. Once again, you'll also have to do that for your quiz. So cell walls is our second way of identifying. So they have that peptidoglycan, which is a term we used in the last unit. And you just need to know that's made of sugar and then the peptides. So don't worry about all the other part of it. But like we just discussed, why is it important for bacteria to have a strong cell wall? Basically for survival. That's the really big key. So reproduction, surviving in an environment. If they don't survive, they can't reproduce. And third up is movement. So some are stationary, like these ones, and some have a flagella to move. So not all bacteria have that flagella. So reproduction. There are two ways they can reproduce. One is sexually. Two is asexually. So sexual reproduction is called conjugation. Make sure you know this word. Basically, they attach and they exchange information and that's it. They basically collide together, exchange their info, and then redivide. It's not normally sexual reproduction in the way you would think about it for other animal species or things like that, but that's how they do it. So asexual reproduction is binary fission. So what happens is it just replicates like a normal cell would and then separates. This is why, right here, it can happen every 20 minutes. This is why it's so common for scientists to use bacteria because of this very fast reproduction. And fun fact, it can become up to 1 billion in 10 hours. That's why you can get sick so fast is because that bacteria in your body is just multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. And there's nothing stopping it. So metabolism, you should know metabolism is how you basically break down your food or how you get your food and then use it to, for energy. Some people have a fast metabolism, some people have a slow metabolism. Well, there's two different ways that bacteria can metabolize. There's photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs. So photo, think about photo, think about light. So to take a photo, you need good light or a flash. So if you do photosynthesis, you need light to live. So photoautotrophs are called cyanobacteria, and they need light to live. If they don't have light, they can't survive. 
And as a, re as a result, just like photosynthesis, <coughs> they release oxygen into the environment. So that's, that's your first type. Your second type is your chemoautotroph. So think chemo, chemical, they use other things. They don't use light. So these ones are going to break down and release some inorganic compounds. We should be familiar with nitrogen and sulfur. And they function to keep those nutrients cycling. Then you also have two kind of different categories. So aerobes and anaerobes. So aerobes are, think about aerobic exercise, you need oxygen. Anaerobic, you don't use oxygen. So this one you require it. This one you do not require it. All right. Survival. So endospores are basically these little things inside of bacteria that allow them to still survive if something happens or a harsh condition happens. So they're little dormant cells. What happens is it forms around part of the DNA of the bacteria. So it forms around part of the DNA, so it's preserving that genetic information from the, from the bacteria cell. Then if the cell dies, or if something happens, that spore is still there. And then the spore, if you look here, here's the spore, it can germinate into another new cell. So examples of this are like anthrax, botulism, tetanus. So these are your really bad bacterial diseases and why it's so hard to fight them, because they have these endospores that ensure that they keep surviving. And there's also mutations in bacteria is another way they survive. So endospores are in this picture right here. And then mutations. So if you think about the environment, when an animal mutates or something mutates, whether it's for good or bad, it takes a long time to happen because of reproduction rates. But like we said, every 20 minutes, that's a pretty quick reproduction rate. So a mutation can take effect pretty quickly in a population of bacteria. And this is what leads to your antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So in the article we read, this is why it's important to always take all of your antibiotics because if you don't finish your, your prescription, all of that bacteria in your body, most of it's killed, but there's still those few remaining strong bacteria. And the minute you stop taking that, that medication, those bacteria are going to repopulate your body and get you sick again. So ecology of bacteria. I know when we think about bacteria, we tend to think about it as being bad, but it's also good. So they're decomposers. That's how they eat, and they return nutrients to soil, environment, or your body. So there's normal flora is the term used for the bacteria in your body. So it's that harmless bacteria in your body. It's what's in the yogurt. It's things in your food and in your body that you need to function. So there's E. coli in your intestines, for example, that makes, makes vitamin K. And this, just to note, is different from the food poisoning kind of E. coli. There's a couple different kinds of it. So some food and medicine that have antibiotics in them, or I shouldn't say antibiotics, sorry, bacteria. So you have cheese, yogurt, pickles. They are made with the help of bacteria. Bacteria is actually used to make chocolate, interesting enough, because it helps break down that cocoa bean covering here. And then in medicine, some antibiotics were originally made by bacteria. So bacteria made them, and then they figured out a way to manufacture it to help cure other bacterial infections. Now the disease-causing kind. So really important to note, only a small percent actually causes disease. And they harm in two ways. So one, bacteria multiply so quickly at the infection site that it's automatically causing harm. Or... Bacteria can secrete a toxin. So for example, botulism, it paralyzes your nervous system cells. So it secretes a toxin, and then your nervous system cells can't function, so it's killing them off. And then pathogens, just in general, this is actually a vocab word that's going to be on your list, are disease-causing bacteria. And then antibiotics, in general, definition-wise, they block the growth and reproduction of bacteria. So here's their ultimate function. You should definitely expect a question about this. How do antibiotics work? Right there. They break down the cell wall. And one other talk about how to control the bad bacteria 
is sterilization. So if you heat or chemically treat bacteria, you will also kill it. So disinfect. So a lot of you like your um, your Lysol wipes or will wipe down things or use your hand sanitizer. That's a chemical way of destroying bacteria. If you refrigerate things, so like food, that's why you could get food poisoning. So if let's say you go out to eat and then you bring home leftovers or you get a pizza and you leave it out and you don't put it in the fridge, bacteria is going to grow on it quicker than what it would if you put it in the refrigerator. And then heating, boiling, those high temps are going to kill bacteria as well. That's why it's really important to fully cook your chicken, for example, so you don't get food poisoning from not killing that bacteria. And that's all on bacteria.